most people alive today have no memory of World War or how the work for peace began. Many live in young nations born in the past half century, others in nations yet to emerge. Of the men and women under 50 flags who began the work of the United Nations a half century ago, few remain to help us understand how far we have come and how far we have yet to go. One man who was there is Harold Stassen, a member of the U.S. delegation who helped shape the U.N. Charter in 1945. He has committed much of his life to its evolution. And even 50 years later, Harold Stassen continues to influence the future of the organization, building a bridge of ideas from the way things were to the way the world might be. Far from the world's oceans, isolated from the interplay of great nations, America's Midwestern prairies would seem a hard place to grow a global perspective. Yet it was on a family farm in Minnesota that a young Harold Stassen began to build his worldview. It really goes back to boyhood on the farm when uh, my father was one of the early subscribers to the National Geographic. We read and talked a great deal about the whole world uh, as we grew up on, on a farm in Dakota County, Minnesota. And that interest uh, followed through from there and of course was discussed with our father and mother and, and uh, very early, I must have been maybe 10 years old, he took me into the St. Paul Auditorium to hear old fighting Bob La Follette of Wisconsin make a great speech about the world and everything else. Stassen graduated from high school at age 14, ran the family farm during his father's illness, then went on to earn a law degree at the University of Minnesota. At the age of 23, he was elected Dakota County District Attorney, and in 1938, the people of Minnesota made him the youngest governor in the nation's history. In the 1930s, Minnesota seemed far from world events. Still struggling in the Great Depression, most Midwestern political leaders only thought of saving farms and creating jobs. But in this century, no one can live in isolation from world events. Beyond the wide prairie horizons, the clouds of war were gathering. There was a sort of a American first emphasis. There were congressmen that were very isolationist, so that there was a sort of a different voice in the Midwest. And then that was debated around Minnesota. In fact, in that uh, 38 campaign, there was a lot of criticism that what was I as a governor talking so much about the world affairs, but my interest was in, as I put it, uh, good government in Minnesota and the right kind of world policies. Despite the high ideals of internationalists, Despite the delusions of appeasement, all hope of peace was shattered in the autumn of 1939. Poland was struck by the lightning of Blitzkrieg, unleashing the storm of World War. Far from the sounds of conflict, protected by thousands of miles of ocean, how would the U.S. react? In 1940, Harold Stassen answered for many Americans in a major speech. I was then selected as a keynoter of the Republican National Convention, and I spoke then about the lights going out in Europe and what it meant to the world. That keynote speech in 1940 was a clear delineation of uh, an affirmative policy toward the world. Any remaining illusions of an America isolated from world issues disappeared in the smoke of Pearl Harbor. Whatever the risks, whatever the outcome, the nation was committed to the global struggle. In his third term as Minnesota governor in 1943, at the height of the war, Stassen continued to develop his worldview. In that Saturday Evening Post article, I pulled together some of the things I've been speaking about, and that was that I believed very strongly, of course, that you might say our side of that Second World War was going to win, and that when we won, 
the United States and France and the United Kingdom and Russia and China. They ought to put together a continuing organization that would go on beyond the war and make the beginning of a United Nations organization. So I spelled that out and then what such a United Nations should do in the world. Among other ideas, Stassen called for proportional representation among nations, commissions to work toward universal literacy and increased world trade, and an effective system for international justice. And his 1943 proposal for a world legion, an international police force to replace the old balance of power principle, pitting nation against nation, rings truer than ever in the post-Cold War 1990s. But before any of these ideas could take hold, there was a war to be won. Stassen resigned his governorship in 1943 to take a commission in the U.S. Navy. He served with distinction on Admiral Halsey's staff in the Pacific. By the spring of 1945, there was no doubt about the coming Allied victory. But the ensuing peace was very much in question, and Stassen's worldview took on greater importance. President Roosevelt asked him to be one of the eight U.S. delegates to help draw up the charter of the United Nations in San Francisco. The U.N. Charter Conference was more than a formality. Delegates from 50 nations brought 50 points of view to every issue. They labored through the summer weeks to hammer out their differences. Their successes and their failures would shape the future of the planet. You see, there was, there was a lot of discussion about should the United States yield any of its sovereignty? That was one of the negative phases of the debates at that time. So then I emphasized that really the sovereignty rests in the people, and then that when you had these kind of world conditions, the people had to see to it that there was another organization that went beyond the national boundaries. And I said that. All the nations will still have their own flags, their own sovereignty, and uh, practically function in every way, except you had to get a de growing development between nations and nations working together for, as I put it, solutions that were somewhat better than the two world wars we'd gone through. One of the toughest issues was what to do with the remains of the crumbling colonial world where millions of indigenous people were governed by strangers from faraway lands. The question was then, how would they be handled under the new organization? And from our delegation, uh, Congressman Saul Bloom and I were assigned to go to work on it. And we finally settled on that, calling them all non-self-governing territories. And then they'd fit into a trusteeship and then the aim of them would be to ultimately get to be self-governing. And that's what's happened around the world. There have been many, many nations that have emerged from trusteeship in different areas of the world, different continents, into self-governing entities and members of the United Nations, as I've kept an interest in those areas. It's a human document, it's not a perfect thing, but it's the best we could do, and we wanted to do it right away before the World War ended, because I was convinced that preventing a third world war should be our main objective, and so we pushed hard. There were many who doubted that agreement could ever be reached by these 50 countries differing so much in race and religion, language and culture. But these differences were all forgotten in one unshakable unity of determination to find a way to end war. The ceremonial signing of the UN Charter in 1945 was not the end of debate and discussion but only the beginning. Over half a century, even as the United Nations worked for peace, development, and human rights, the world has changed. New issues have come to the fore. New challenges and opportunities are on the horizon 
and the UN must continue to evolve, expanding its scope and redefining its mission. Through five decades of political life and legal practice, Harold Stassen has never put aside his commitment to the World Organization. His global vision remains keen and fresh, and he continues to work for UN Charter reform. Approaching the 50th anniversary of the United Nations, Harold Stassen looked to its future. The most important thing the United Nations has achieved is the fact that there has not been a Third World War. We need to think in terms that we want to safeguard the future of children all over Mother Earth, and that should be a part of the restructuring. There are times, of course, when they have shown an inadequacy, and one of the ways is not having any kind of a United Nations police force of its own. So you have to call on other countries to send in troops, and that's not the best way to do it. So that the United Nations of the future that I hold should have a United Nations Legion. Not a war-making machine, but a small, elite, multilingual force that could go in to help mediators as they work on mediation and to be a fine blue line between the contending elements to try to prevent the shooting from starting. The other thing that you do need is a world network of mediators, skilled, experienced mediators that cover Mother Earth so that any place there's a problem, a skilled mediator can be in there between the contending powers, analyzing, trying to fit together, figure out a way to work out the problem and staying with it. For there to be a network of mediators that are skilled and respected and a United Nations Legion that is skilled and respected, they got to spring from an organization that has some logic and sense to it. So they have to spring out of an organization in which you straighten out the Security Council and you straighten out the Assembly. It's very important in the United Nations of the future that both Japan and Germany become permanent members of the Security Council, along with the five that have been there and are there. Well, then if you step up from five to seven, if you give all seven the same kind of a veto the five have had, it'll be very bad in too many individual vetoes that have the potential of blocking things. So there are various ways that can then be corrected. You could either say that of the seven, two or three, you could either way say must agree in order to block action. Now that means that the United States would not have the power all alone to say no. They'd have to get some others to go with them, and so would anybody else. So that you have to redefine, in other words, the veto. Right now, less than 10% of the people can put together a majority vote in this assembly. It's not democratic, it's not sound, not logical. I'm suggesting that the best way to correct it is say, Every sovereign entity can have a voice, can speak in the assembly, but they'd have voting rights that would have some kind of a scale that would relate to the significance of the country and its people. I think you've got to have some source of revenue that doesn't come up for annual congressional or parliamentary decisions. I'm suggesting that if in adopting the charter they agree that all international movements of goods and materials, and oil and everything else, would have a one half of 1% charge on it that would go toward financing the United Nations. Clearly, the clash between people of different religions and some places has become